Welcome to another installment of Donning the Armor. This morning we will begin in Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so all the people who were in the camp trembled. Once again, I mentioned before not to get too much in numerology, but on the third day, we see this third day a lot. Yeah, three is the symbol of the Trinity. It's the sign of Jonah. It's the sign of the resurrection. But here we hear a trumpet. God coming down in a thick cloud on the mountain. The arrival of God coming at the sound of a trumpet. A blare so loud that all the people who were around heard it and trembled in fear. Well, there's going to be a trumpet sound again. And that's when Christ returns to bring his bride to him. There are going to be trumpets and revelation. Those are going to be ones that make people tremble. When God comes, it comes with the fanfare of heaven. And should come with the fanfare of his creation. Because if we are in the presence of God... There is nothing greater we could ever experience. And it should come with fanfare. It should come with a warning to be ready. A warning showing that the true authority and sovereign of creation is coming to make way for the one who is coming in all his glory, in all his power. If you deny him, you harden to him, you're going to tremble in fear. If you're for him, there's going to be some trembling, there's going to be some fear, but it's going to be an awe-inspiring, a joyous fear. A fear mixed with excitement for the coming of our Father. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked gently. Such is the power of God that an entire mountain could move and quake as if it's a furnace. Even the greatest of a mountain cannot stand under the power of the presence of the Lord. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long, became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through the gaze to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. Now this break out, it almost sounds like, make sure they consecrate themselves before they anger me and I attack them. But that's not the way this is. The Lord is perfectly just. He must punish sin. It is his nature. You know, I've asked before, is there anything that limits the power of the omnipotent God? Most people say, no, he's omnipotent. He's all powerful. Nothing. He has no limits. And I posit, there's one thing that limits the Lord. And it's glorious. The Lord is limited by his nature. Now, what is the nature of the Lord? The nature of the Lord is perfection. Something we can only pretend to understand in truth. We actually have no understanding of what exactly perfect is because we aren't it and we've never seen it as a people. 
We've known of God. We've known of Christ. But we have never seen them. We have never seen what it is to be perfect. We can't be perfect, so we don't have an understanding of it. But God's nature is perfection. He is perfectly, completely sovereign. He is perfectly just and he is perfectly loving. But because of that perfect justice, all sin must be punished. All sin separates God or humanity from God. The wages of all sin is death. Now, he looks at different sins in different ways. He calls some abominations. He calls some abominable. That is basically, it is almost vomitous is the way that is. Now, it isn't quite the way that some denominations have broken it up where you have cardinal sins, you have deadly sins, you have these sins. It's not quite that because in the end, all sin is equal. In the fact that all the wages of all sin is death. So you, you sin one thing, you've sinned them all. That's the problem with trying to live by the law. You want to live by the law, the Lord will let you live by the law. But if you choose to live by the law, you will be judged perfectly by the law. And the law is impossible to keep. Which is why we needed grace. So it's not that the Lord is going to break out of them in anger. But it's that the glory of the Lord, his perfect judgment, they come before him, not consecrated. They will come before him in a sinful state and he will break out against them. They will face the wages of that sinfulness that they come before him in. But Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up the Mount Sinai for you warned us saying, set bounds around the mountains and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, away, get down and then come up you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. So you go, well, that's weird. Why did God forget? But I, I see this. As a sign of obedience. The Lord has said to Moses, this is what I expect of you. And we'll see this a couple times. The Lord do this with Moses throughout the next couple chapters where he'll say something to Moses because he's testing where Moses's loyalty lies. Does it lie with obedience to the Lord or not? He's going to be the leader of the people for 40 years. He's making sure he is who he says he is. Now, of course, the Lord knows in the end what it is, but we still have to make our choices. The Lord might know what our choices are, but we still have to make them. And he's positing to Moses a choice to show obedience or not. So moving on to chapter 20, and God spoke all of these saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So the second commandment, the first one, you shall have no other gods before me. Pretty simple. Gods is literally anything you place above the Lord. An idol, idolatry is literally anything. If you place baseball above God, that is now your new God. Uh, some people want to believe, okay, well, this means that there are many gods and God's confirming the right now. It's not gods. There's only one God. It's little g gods. It is idols. You can make an idol of anything. So he's saying you are to have nothing before me. I come first. That's why unbelievers always scoff when Christians, especially evangelical Christians, will say God, family, country, or God, family, and whatever else. Uh, there's a baseball player, Anthony Rendon. It was kind of funny, his comment coming from him, 
because he said that the season shouldn't be as long considering the guy's always injury plagued and never plays a full season anyway. So it was funny coming before him, but what he said actually was legitimate and true. And I completely stand by whether it was said in the way that I see it or not, is that he said, look, I might be a professional baseball player, but professional baseball is not my life. God and family are my life. And that is the correct order of things. God, family, and to him, baseball. Absolutely. That's the way it should be. Because you can actually make an idol of your own children, of your own wife, if you place them before God. Now, uh, commandment two is something that I've seen some denominations basically try to get rid of about making carved images. Now, you have some reformed who go way too far and say, basically, that Jesus behind me, that's blasphemous. I have that. I'm going to hell because that's basically a carved image of God. But you need to get to verse five. You shall not make for yourself any carved image of anything. So any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth beneath, there is in the water of the earth. Anything. So basically, if you have a picture, a scribble, then you've broken this commandment as well. Not just me with the risen Jesus behind me. Because you're missing out on what the meaning of the verse is. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. This you little Jesus of my daughters, it's adorable. It's cute. It's a sweet little reminder. She actually, it's the only reason it's even down here and it's been down here for the last couple months is because I got really sick over Christmas and she gave it to me so I could sleep with it and so I could hug Jesus. But I don't serve that Jesus. I don't bow down. I don't pray to that Jesus. It's just a plush. It's an adorable little plush. They sell it at Hallmark. Now, as for this jealous God, it's not jealousy in the way that we get jealous. It's a righteous jealousy. Because God is our creator. He should be above all else. He gave us life. He gave us creation. He gives us blessings. He, he provides for us. He should come first. And he deserves to be jealous when we put something else before him. Now, this visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations, every person's sin is accounted to themselves. So this is not saying that if the father is sinful and his iniquity, I'm going to keep counting it to his grandkids and his great-grandkids and his great-great-grandkids. Now, it's saying that when a father is wicked and does not honor God, that lineage of wickedness is going to continue, sometimes for generations, as we call them now in our own speech, generational curses. The iniquity will follow. Cain, Cain had children. Those children had children. And you could see and track the wickedness that continued. Not for Seth. But for Cain, in his iniquity to God, continued. Because that's the iniquity he raised his children to walk in. So those who love and keep God's commandments, they're going to teach their kids to love and keep God's commandments. And his mercy will continue to flow abundantly. You can break a generational curse. Those third and fourth generations don't have to be in, a, at, in, in, in enmity with God. They don't have to be. They choose to be because they follow their fathers. Some people will be raised with God and will walk away. And that's a hard thing to take as a father, watching your children walk away. I never had to experience because my children are young and hopefully I never have to experience it. Hopefully they walk with the Lord throughout the rest of their lives. But I knew people who have had their kids walk away and it is hard. But there's also a time where you can be like myself and not raised with any of this at all. To be baptized into the Roman denomination, but never be confirmed, never go to church, never do any of that. Never read the Bible, never have a Bible. They have no knowledge of Christ growing up. And then at 38, 39 years old, go, I want Christ in my life. See, those, those iniquities can be 
yours to choose because you're an individual and God has given you that free will. But moving on to verse seven, you shall not take the name of your, the Lord, your God in vain for God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Taking his name in vain isn't to just say curse words. It is to make God's name empty. You profess yourself to be a Christian, but you do any and everything you can find that goes against God, you taking his name in vain. You have taken his name in vain because you are not what you profess to be. And you are showing the world around him, a world that you should be light for, that God's name is empty. And that will not be forgotten by God. Now it does say, you can blaspheme the name of Christ. You can blaspheme the name of, the God, of God. You cannot blaspheme the works of the Holy Spirit. That's the unforgivable sin. If you refuse to accept the divine work of Christ on the cross, that will not be forgiven you. Everything else, God will forgive as long as you trust in him and obey his commandments. As long as you turn back to him. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. When God saw that his work was complete, that seventh day, that became a hallowed and perfect day because it became the day of completion and we're to honor that day. Now people say, how come Christians don't keep the Sabbath as the Jews do now? Um, because Christ is our Sabbath. Remember these 10 commandments, we're not held on any of these 10 commandments anymore in so far as they're written by the law. We're no longer under the law. We are under the covenant of grace. We keep these commandments in honor of the commandments given to us by Christ to love your God with all your heart, soul, and might in mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So these first four commandments that we just went over, we follow them because we follow the commandment of Jesus to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Now, the next six we're going to go over. We follow them as Christians, not because they're written in Exodus, but because they were told to us by Christ to follow them by loving our neighbor as ourself. We are under the covenant of grace and follow the commandments of Christ. The commandments of the law are followed simply because of Christ's later commandments. We are not under the law as the Jewish people were. But continuing in verse 7, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord is giving you. Honor your mother and father does not mean obey your mother and father. Your mother and father could be wicked. You're not going to obey wickedness. It's kind of what the other verse up above said about the iniquity of fathers upon their children. But what it kind of speaks to is that honor your mother and father is to honor your mother and father in their old age. To honor them and help take care of them the way they took care of you in your youth. Because in many of the cultures around them, when you got old, you were cast aside. If you had wisdom and you were useful, sure, you were kept. But if you were just some broken down old man, no, you're food for the wolves. You're useless. So God say no. You're to honor and care for your parents in the way they cared for you when you were useless to them. You shall not murder. You shall not kill is the King James, thou shalt not kill is a really bad translation. Because as we see, killing is sometimes justified. Killing for self-defense is justified. Murder is the taking of an innocent human life. That is something we shouldn't do. Killing is not taking the, the 
life of an innocent human being. Because killing, sometimes is killing somebody who is bent on murder. Those things are not equal. Not in the eyes of God and shouldn't be in the eyes of us. Murder is taking an innocent life. Not just ending a life. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So we get it. Adultery, we understand why that's bad. Stealing, we know not to do that. Bearing false witness, we are not to go rumor mongering. We are not to accuse someone of something they didn't do. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Covet it is more than just wanting it. It's not just even sometimes not even just desiring their specific things. And that is also what this is speaking about. Coveting their actual things, wanting what they have to be yours. But sometimes it is also coveting what they have. You see your neighbor get a brand new big screen TV. It's twice the size of yours. You really want that that TV, man. You really are jealous of that TV. So you're going to put yourself in debt to get it. That is also coveting it. You're not stealing his. But you're letting your, your envy of someone else's belongings do this. Cause your actions to change. And putting it above where you should be. We should never envy what other people have. Because oftentimes we'll learn that we have things that they don't. I mentioned in an earlier episode, I don't measure success by the way other people measure success. People might have a beautiful house. They might have better possessions than me. Because they have this great job and this great wealth. I don't measure success in that way. I'm not envious of what they have because I have what is enviable. I have Christ. I have a loving wife. I have two amazing children. To me, that is the thing to be envied. That is the thing to which everybody should wish to have and aspire to. To have Christ And a loving family. Because that's really what you need. Because all that other stuff is going to fade. And guess what? When your house burns down, you're not going to care about your house. You're going to care about your wife and kids. And you're going to be praising Jesus for their salvation through that trial. Because that's what truly matters. And that's where success truly is. But as you can see, these last six commandments all are tied up in Loving your neighbor as yourself. You're not going to be envious of them. You're not going to steal from them. You're not going to want to commit adultery. You're not going to want to do these things, murder them if you're loving them as yourself. And that second commandment of Jesus, that loving your neighbor as yourself, flows from the first. Because you're not going to love your neighbor as yourself if you don't love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Because you're not going to recognize the divinity and creation and awesomeness of God in your neighbor if you don't love God to begin with. Now, all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear you, but let not God speak with us lest we die. They can see all of this the thundering, the flashing, the sounds of the trumpet, the spoking mountain. And they are terrified that if they go before God, they will die. They see the glory and righteousness and fury that is the presence of God. And they're terrified, and maybe rightly so. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. As Jesus said, fear not the man who can kill your body, but fear the Lord who can kill your body and your soul. Fear the one who can't just judge you here on earth. Fear the one who's going to judge you when this life ends. 
Now, for a believer, it shouldn't be a fearful fear, a terrified fear. It should be an awe-inspiring fear. Because we know we have righteousness through Christ. And we know as powerful as that father of ours is, that our advocate is going to sit there and say, he's with us, Father. He is with us. He belongs here with us. He is one of our children. And Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. A lot of people don't like that, that, oh, you don't do, you don't, oh, you only abstain from bad things because you're God. You want to be afraid of God. Oh, that's a loving God who's afraid of him. Well, a lot of these things I didn't understand either because I was an atheist for so long. But having two children and raising two children has made me understand God at a level I could not before I had kids. And how often fear and respect kind of become the same thing. My children love and respect me. But they do fear me because I'm the disciplinarian of the house. And because they fear the discipline that is to come, they do the right thing. Is that a bad thing? Am I not loving because they fear discipline will come in whatever form that is? So they don't want to do the wrong thing? No, that's good. Because as the discipline my daughter is now going to be under what I call natural consequences. She's 10. You don't want to clean your room. You don't ever have to clean your room. I'll clean your room. But know that the stuff that's making the mess in your room is never going to dirty it again because I'm going to get rid of it. That's the natural consequences of your actions. And because of that, she's going to want to keep her room clean because of the fear of the discipline to come. Discipline doesn't have to come with a strike. It doesn't have to come with a punishment. Sometimes discipline comes by letting natural consequences carry themselves out. But it's loving to discipline your kids because they're not to be wild. They're not to be chaotic because God, their true father, is a God of order. And we are to be orderly for him. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, you have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me. Gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. I know that hits some denominations hard, but this is different from the idolatry. He's saying, then you will not raise any idol above me. Here he's saying, you are not to make an idol to be as me, to stand in for me. You're not to be praying to that giant gold cross. I am not the giant gold cross. I am the God who was crucified on that cross, was buried in a tomb because I was taken off the cross and who was risen again. The biggest thing that the northern kingdom of Israel, after the schism and they split into Judah and Israel, the biggest problem that Judah had, uh, Israel had, is they created two golden calves Not to worship idols, not to worship false gods, but to worship God incorrectly. That was Jeroboam's issue. That was the evil and curse of Jeroboam for his people. He did not heed this here. That you shall not make anything to be with me. I don't need anything. I am me. You don't need to try to make an image of me to pray to. 
an altar of earth you shall make for me. You shall sacrifice on, on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings. Your sheep and your oxen in every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. And if you make to me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone. For if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. If you make an altar of stone, you stack stones. All these elaborate altars we see in churches and cathedrals, they are profaned by the word of God. We are not to do that. That's what God's telling us. Because we are not to be, we are not to be worshiping the altar. We're to worship the God of the altar. God wanted simple for his people because he wanted to be the one elevated above all else. He doesn't want people's eyes on the altar. He wants their eyes on him. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. All right, that's a, that's a regional thing. That's a time thing. Basically, you're not going to have an altar on anything that would you would have to walk up steps to get to because they wore robes. They didn't wear underwear. So basically saying literally, as you would walk up to the altar, your legs would be moving, your robe would be flowing, and your genitalia would be exposed to me. And I don't want that. So don't do that. So moving on to chapter 21. Now these are the judgments which you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years. And in the seventh, he shall go free and pay nothing. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and children shall be her master's. And he shall go out by himself. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, to the doorpost, and to his master. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and his servant shall serve him forever. So, this is part of the slavery discourse people don't like to speak about. And when Christians start to bring up, well, slavery was different. In the Bible, this is what they're talking about, because this is not really talking about slavery as much as it's talking about bond servitude. Somebody selling themselves into bondage to pay off a debt normally. A master would have money. This person says, hey, I owe 7,000 shekels to person X. If you pay person X, I will work for you for seven years or whatever the set time is. That's bond servitude. That is a completely different thing. It's almost actually employment. Um, so you're a servant. You're also not supposed to treat servants, especially Hebrew servants, poorly. I went over slavery in an earlier episode, and I don't, I don't, I don't shy away from the fact that there's slavery in the Bible because I kind of understand why it's there. I've, I feel as though I understand where the Bible is coming from in that regard. People say I'm wrong. That's fine. They say my interpretation's wrong. That's fine. But I know what I feel in my heart to be the understanding of slavery in the Bible. And I went through it a couple episodes ago. But it's interesting. It says that when he goes free, he goes free by himself. If he came in with a wife, then he leaves with his wife. If he didn't have a family though, and he gained one while in servitude, those servants that were already under the master's house, he's not taking them out. But if a servant loves his master's house enough and he's been treated so well that he doesn't want to leave, then he becomes a member permanently of that servant class for that household. So then they would stretch his ear, the lobe of his ear over the door and pierce it with a nail and all. And then they would put a circular earring in it. Basically as the first link in an imaginary chain to that house. That he is chained to that household for his life. It's kind of a beautiful symbolism. And if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. 
So he's not going to be freed in the same way that the male servants are. If she does not please her master who has betrothed her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. So if she's not pleasing, because basically he's buying her as a concubine or a wife, if it's not pleasing, then she can be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to foreign people since he has dealt deceitfully with her. So if he's dealt deceitfully, he brought her in to be betrothed, but he doesn't like her. He's dealt deceitfully. He can't just sell her off to a foreign people. That's not the way this works. She needs to be redeemed properly by her own people. And if he has betrothed her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters. So if he buys a female slave to be his son's wife, he's now going to not treat her like a slave. He's going to have to treat her like a daughter-in-law, like he would any other one. If he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food or clothing and her marriage rights. So if he has this slave as a wife and a concubine and he takes another one, you can't treat her as any less now. She's still got her rights, which is something people see something like this and they balk like a female servant is a slave. That's so wrong. But once again, baby steps for an infant nation. Women were treated far worse by everybody else around them. And God knows this is what they came from. So in order to get them to go where he wants them to go, he needs to lead them along by the hand, nice and slow, to get them where they need to be. Because you can't jump from toddlerhood, from crawling to running. You need to take your baby steps first. You're not going to be an adult. You need to go through. You need to be weaned into this stuff. And God knows that about his fledgling nation and people. And if he does not do these three for her, then she shall go free without paying money. So she's not being kept to the same way that a male servant is. Basically, if all any of these things are not being done, then she can just go. Her debt's completely forgiven. Because you didn't do what you were supposed to do with a woman. Women are more precious and fragile than men, and they are to be treated as such. That's what God's saying. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. However, if he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. It's the difference between murder and manslaughter. If you murder somebody, you're going to be put to death. If, and we'll get further into that in Joshua and Deuteronomy. However, if he did not lie in wait, meaning if if this wasn't premeditated, that this is manslaughter, there will, I will appoint a place for him to flee, which ends up being a sanctuary city of place, uh, a type of place. He, he, there is a city of sanctuary where he can go to, and he needs to stay there. His case will be heard. If they find out, no, he murdered him, he goes back and gets put to death. If he flees and they find out, no, you're right, it's manslaughter, he needs to live in that city until the high priest dies. High priest dies in two years, then you go back to where you lived in two years. High priest outlives you, well, you live in that sanctuary city forever. It's it's what it is. But there needs to be rules set up, and once again, baby steps. But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. So once again, murder, premeditated murder, death penalty immediately. And he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Honoring your mother and father. You want to strike out. This is not like child slapping their dad. This is a person striking their mother and father in anger to result in injury. You get put to death for that because you are to honor your mother and father. He who kidnaps a man and sells him, if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. What's that about God endorses slavery? You kidnap a man and sell him into slavery, you shall be put to death. God is actually saying that Jacob's brothers should have been put to death. The Midianite traders should have been put to death. That's what God's saying. No, slavery is not. Slavery is different from bond servantry, but it's also 
not something God wants for his people. Even if he allows slavery through captivity from um, conquered armies, he allows them to do that, does not endorse it, because baby steps. And he who curses his father and his mother shall surely be put to death. If men contend with each other and one of them strikes another with a stone or with his fist, then he does not die, but is confined to his bed. If he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be acquitted. He shall only pay for the loss of his time and shall provide for him to be thoroughly healed. So if they get into a fight and one's injured but survives, then the, uh, the, um, the guilty party has to make restitution has to pay for the loss of his time because it could be hard of his season. He needs to pay for that. He has to provide for him, but he will not be put to death. He will be acquitted of the crime. And if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he remains alive a day or two, he shall not be punished for he is his property. So if you punish him, you discipline your female servant, with a rod, meaning you, know, you hit him hard, you discipline him severely. If he remains alive, then you're not going to be put to death because he is technically your property. He is your beast of burden in a way. But it's a warning. You need to watch what you're doing because they may be your property. But one strike, one strike can kill a man. People seem to forget how fragile human beings are. And you see people get in the fights and you see some of the horrible things people do to each other. And you don't realize just how easy it is to kill a human being. One hit sometimes is all it's taking. So in saying, yeah, if he survives, you're going to be kind of acquitted because he's your property. You're right. But that one hit may be all it takes. And if that happens to death with you, be forewarned. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him and he shall pay as the judges determine. So you get into a fight and you hit a pregnant woman? and she goes into labor, you're now at the mercy of the woman's husband. And he, you will pay as the judges determine, which means they're going to make sure it's just as imperfectly as they can. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. If a man strikes the eye of his female or male servant and destroys it, then he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, then he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. You know, Gandhi had that really dumb saying, an eye for an eye makes the entire world go blind. But that's to not understand why an eye for an eye exists. See, God's telling this to his people, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, meaning a wound for a wound. See, in the old ways, you hit me and take out my eye, damage my eye, I kill you. You take my hand, you make me lame, you burn me, you wound me, I kill your entire family. That's the way it was. And that's how these blood feuds between tribes would go on for hundreds and thousands of years. Because there was no proportionality to the punishment. So what God is implementing is saying, your punishment needs to be proportional to the damage done. If you got into a fight, if someone attacked you and knocked out your tooth, then you can knock out their tooth. They break your foot, you can break their foot. You got knocked over and you got burned in a a fire, 
you can burn them in a fire. They take the life of your brother, you can take their life. Proportional response. Sometimes sayings, these deep pretend philosophical sayings, like an eye for an eye makes the whole world go blind. They sound deep, but they ignore the depravity of human nature and what came before God placed these laws into the world. They were natural laws in the world. God wrote them on the heart of his people, but they were hard to them. Now he's having them codified through his people, through that nation of priests that he is establishing in Israel. People look at the Bible 2,000 years later, 2,000 years after Christ, because that's where we're at, 2024 AD, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, 2024. And they go, look at how outdated this is. We should never do that. No, because we progressed past these baby steps that the Lord has placed on his nation. But your secular law came from these biblical laws. Directly from them. We are only where we are because they began here. So though these may sound outdated and they may seem harsh, they are progressing to a better and more perfect morality that we have not even seen yet and will not until Christ takes his throne in earnest. So that's where we will stop for today. I know we went long. Hope it was fruitful for you. Hope to see you again next time. But until then, be blessed.